We know all these forces are important in fluid mechanics, so now let's see how we can combine them into different ratios to tell us which forces are most important at different times when we're looking at different fluid phenomena in MEC 241. So we expect all of these to change in different ways as we change the size of our flow, but we could look at the ratios of them to see which ones we expect to be important and when we expect them to be important. If we look at inertial forces versus viscous forces, take the ratio of the inertial force divided by the viscous force and do some cancelling out, we'll wind up with rho UL over mu. And in fact, the Reynolds number, the single most important dimensionless group in fluid mechanics, is what we get from this ratio of inertial forces to viscous forces. And it'll wind up being the velocity times the length scale divided by the kinematic viscosity, where the kinematic viscosity is just the ratio of the dynamic viscosity and the density. It's always important, always important to know how strong the viscous forces are versus the inertial forces. Sometimes, however, it's only important to be able to say that the Reynolds number is large, that inertial forces really dominate over viscous forces, and that there's not much going on that has very much to do with friction. If we compare inertial forces to surface tension forces, we can follow the same process and get this ratio, which, got, which has got velocity squared and length scale on the top and surface tension on the bottom. And that dimensionless group turns out to be the Weber number. It's important in drops and bubbles. It's important in telling us whether surface tension forces are going to have any significant effect on the flow that we're interested in. It shows up as major importance in drops and bubbles because as you increase the Weber number, the inertial force goes up. That means that the flow around the bubble is much better able to disrupt or break up the bubble or the drop into smaller bubbles or drops by deforming the shape. If we compare inertial versus gravitational forces, we can put the inertial force on top and the gravitational force on the bottom. And taking those values and canceling through, we wind up with velocity squared on top, gravity and length scale on the bottom. If we take the square root of that, we'll wind up with the value that's commonly known as the Froude number. This Froude number is comparing the energy of motion, the inertial force, with the gravitational forces that tend to restore the uh, position of the surface of the water. Really important if you're building ships or comparing how waves form. Really important in open channel flow. Usually not very important in most mechanical engineering contexts. If we compare the magnitude of pressure forces versus inertial forces, then we'll wind up with the pressure force divided by the inertial force some pressure times length squared over rho u squared l squared, or p over rho u squared. So we can see that that's a dimensionless group that has something to do with pressure. We can use that to define a pressure coefficient, and typically we'll do that with the pressure minus the ambient pressure, and we'll work a factor of two in here because of Bernoulli's equation, which you'll see later on. And that's a dimensionless pressure. That tells us how large the pressure is compared to the pressure that would be generated by bringing the flow to a stop. These two are really important if we're trying to consider forces due to pressure that are resulting in either drag or lift. You can see we've got a similar arrangement there. Here we had our pressure coefficient. Here we've got a drag force per unit area. Here we've got a lift force per unit area with the same units as pressure from this force per unit area. This allows us to get a dimensionless sense of how large the drag is, or a dimensionless sense of how large the lift is. Finally, another important dimensionless group that doesn't really come from a ratio of forces is a ratio of velocities. The ratio of the velocity of the flow to the speed of sound in that fluid. Really important in compressible flows, especially flows at high speeds. And it's not important as long as the Mach number is less than about 0.3, which corresponds to about 100 meters per second in air. So in this course, we won't be worrying about compressible flow, but you may run into high Mach numbers in, uh, in later courses in fluid mechanics. 
You may also need to check and make sure that the Mach number isn't over about 0.3 so that you know you can get away with applying the kind of analysis we're doing in this course. All of these dimensionless groups have their roots in the 19th century. This is Osborne Reynolds, William Froude, Ernst Mach, and Moritz Weber, and they were all born many, many years ago. You probably won't get your number named after you because they got there first and they carved out all of the important ground in fluid mechanics. If you do get a number named after you, you'll be standing on the shoulders of giants like these uh, when you do get that recognition. Dimensionless groups show up everywhere, particularly in fluids and heat transfer. These are the things that allow us to make sense of the huge collection of results that we've got and compare two situations that are similar but not identical to see if the flows are behaving the same way. If you've got a collection of important dimensionless groups, say n of them, some number like five, if you had five dimensionless groups, if you made four of them all the same, then the fifth one would turn out to have the same value as well. So in our flows, we most, most often do that by making sure that we have geometric similarity and Reynolds number similarity, for example. If we've got dimensional similarity and Reynolds number similarity, then we can expect that the drag coefficient will be the same at that Reynolds number or the lift coefficient will be the same at that Reynolds number. Here's an example looking at drag coefficients on a sphere. And you'll see that there are different results for smooth and rough. There's the smooth drag coefficient and there's the rough drag coefficient. They're pretty similar except when we get up to here. They've been plotted versus Reynolds number and this data here for drag coefficient represents a huge amount of data all of which fits onto the same line because the only thing that's important is the Reynolds number in determining the drag coefficient. That means that we can take experiments that were done on, on spheres at small scales and scale them up to see what we expect to see happening at a much larger scale. In many mechanical engineering contexts, we're interested in lift and drag on automobiles, on aircraft, on just about anything that's moving through the air or the water. Important groups are going to include for certain the geometry. What size, or sorry, what shape are the things that we're looking at, including the details of the shape. For instance, the roughness height compared to the main length of the body. Reynolds number, always important, and that will tell us what the drag coefficient is or what the lift coefficient is for performance in our, our real system. So we can scale our model performance up to a larger or down to a smaller sized system. When are the various dimensionless groups important? Well, Reynolds number, almost always, but sometimes it's enough just to make sure it's large. Mach number, only if it gets big enough that compressible flow effects are important. And that'll only happen when the velocities in the flow are getting up towards the speed of sound. So as long as we keep the Mach number under about 0.3, we can ignore it. The Froude number, if you're going to be a civil engineer or a naval architect, you definitely need to worry about Froude numbers. But not so much if we're going to be a mechanical engineer. We're very much interested in the Reynolds number. And if we have a small scale flow, like atomization or the uh, rain falling through the air, then we'll be interested in the Weber number because that's going to tell us how drops and bubbles are deforming under the influences of the, the flow around them.